Thanks, guys. If you have your Bibles, then I hope you do. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5, and in just a moment, we're going to look at that passage that we've been studying the last couple of weeks. We're going to study next week as well. We don't do this very often, but I just want to give you a little bit of a preview for next week. I want you to start thinking about who you can invite next week, because we're going to wrap up this series, The Conspiracy of Hope. The whole sermon is going to be uh, on the topic of hope, which is something that resonates uh, with a good number of people, and so it's a great opportunity, I think, to invite others. But not only that, uh, next week during the sermon, we are going to have a uh, transformation video uh, that I think is going to be uh, very impactful. Back in, around the Christmas time, we, we told the story of one of our church members in Van Buren who began to write to a prisoner uh, in prison here in, in the state of Arkansas and how moving it was to her to build those relationships. Well, next week, we're, you're going to see the interview with that prisoner of uh, what it meant for her. And uh, she is out now, and we shot that a couple weeks ago. And, and so this coming week, I think it's going to be a very impactful video. So no matter where somebody has been or what they've been through, what they're gone through, if they're struggling at this moment, I think next week uh, will be a very important time for them to be here. It, it is one of those kind of outreach kind of sermons. Today's topic is going to require some spiritual maturity. Today's topic is a little bit more uh, for those who, who already love Jesus, and, and now the text, I think, is going to confront us in a deep way. Next week is kind of a, a front door entry way. And, and, and to prove how this is, today's topic is going to be much more spiritually in-depth, I want to just start with a basic question. Is, is there a Christian way to hate Tom Brady? I'm asking for a friend. I... Uh, I mean, I respect what the man has done, but I'm a Cowboys fan. And as a Cowboys fan, we have this gift every January where we don't have the stress and strain to worry about what our team is going to do. And, and, and so we just have to pick who we're going to root against. And, and obviously in the NFC, we just don't want the Eagles to whatever happens, just don't let the Eagles win uh, because that would just be ridiculous. Uh, to, to have to even deal with that in any way whatsoever. But, but in the AFC, I was always kind of a Peyton Manning fan. And Peyton Manning and Tom Brady, you know, we're all about the same age, uh, generally speaking. And uh, so Peyton and Tom were always competing back and forth. And you just always got the sense that Peyton was going to find a way to choke and that Tom was going to find a way to get lucky, right? I mean, he won the Orange Bowl his senior year at Michigan. He won the Orange Bowl, Bowl because Alabama missed an extra point. I mean, this is just kind of the Tom Brady way, right? He went to the Super Bowl a couple years ago because Pete Carroll can't run the ball, right? He just, I mean, he's good. I'm not downplaying the, the, the greatness of who he is. I just, just don't like him. And I want to root against him in every way possible. But it's amazing what he's doing. He's 40. He's three years older. I mean, three, three years. He's three months. I'm, I'm struggling to come to terms with that reality. He's, he's three months older than I am. We're about the same height. We both married women that make more, make more money than us. He, now, he, I mean, he is 38 pounds heavier than I am. Big boned, he says. And, and so, but it's amazing to me because at my age, the guy said, hey, do you want to go play basketball? And I'm like, no, I don't want to go play basketball. Well, why not? You love basketball. Yeah, because guys my age get hurt playing basketball. Like, hamstrings, you know, get strained and Achilles tendons snap and next thing you know, you're spending thousands of dollars with Garlow for him to repair things so he can, you know, go buy vacation homes, those kind of things. And I don't, I don't want to be any part of that whatsoever. Meanwhile, Tom Brady is standing in the pocket in the NFL taking hit after hit after hit. It is amazing what this man has done. And, and you just keep on waiting at his age. You just think that eventually he's just going to like break in the middle of a game. It's going to be like, you know, interesting to watch, but he doesn't. He just keeps on winning. And so today, who would you want on your team? Tom Brady or Blake Bortles? Those are your options for quarterback. Tom Brady or Blake Bortles? Blake Bortles, who when Tom Brady was winning the national championship with, at Michigan, was in preschool. Tom Brady has more championship rings than Blake Bortles has playoff appearances. There's a difference there. Now, now, Blake might be successful. I mean, he's a, he's a big guy. He's a good quarterback. They're playing well. He might be successful. But if you had to pick today, Tom Brady or Blake Boyles or Case Keenum or Nick Foles or anybody else, you would want, no matter how much he irritates you, Tom Brady on your team. Why? Because he's proven. He's proven. You just know... He's going to find a slimy way to win. 
You just know it. You know things are being deflated. There's video streams coming in. He's stealing signs. All the time being Mr. American Pie, but you just know that him and Belichick have a way and they already got you beat before you walk out on the field. You know it. He's proven. He's been tested. You don't know what Blake Bortles is going to do today. You don't know. He might throw up in the huddle the first time he gets out there because he's so nervous because he's never been on this stage before. You don't know. He might, he might be successful, but you don't know. You know Tom Brady's not going to choke. Oh, it would be so much fun. But you know it's just not going to happen. See how this is for the spiritually mature today? Whenever we look at Romans 5, And the text is going to talk today about character. The translation of that word, we struggle with it to get the Greek word into the English. And we just take that word character, which is is good, it's a meaningful word, but, but from an English standpoint, the word character can be used in multiple ways. I've told you before that whenever I'm doing the funeral of somebody who just doesn't love Jesus at all, I don't lie. I, I don't lie, that's not my job, but but I don't, want to have to t- I don't have to tell all the truth that I know. And so I might say, man, this guy was a character. What I'm saying there is he was horrible, but, but interesting in his own unique way. Now you're going to wonder how I'm going to talk at your funeral if I'm there, right? But you can use the word character, good or bad. That's, that's not what's going on here. From the Greek standpoint, this word translated in English, it and like the, the Holdman Standard Version picks it up, and some of the other translations picked it up. The ESV doesn't pick it up so much here. It means proven character, tested. It's been put through the fire. And that, this text says, is what ultimately produces hope. Let's remind ourselves of this text, Romans chapter 5, beginning of verse number 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Every word. I want you to consider every word. Every word that you say, every word that you write, every word that you speak to yourself, every word that you whisper in your own little head. Every word. You see, whenever it comes to this topic of character, the the struggle that we have with it, even as, as good Christian people, the struggle that we have with it is, generally speaking, we all think we have pretty good character. We compare ourselves to somebody else, and we we eventually find somebody who is far worse than we are from an ethical or a moral or or, or just a general life kind of standpoint, and comparing ourselves to them, we think to ourselves, we're not that bad. And the struggle here is, if the idea of this text and the idea of Paul is that hope is the overflow, it's the byproduct now of a proven, a tested, a strong character, and we deceive ourselves into thinking that we have that character, but then hope does not follow along, we're going to begin to be confused into wondering, is this text wrong or not? Not realizing that if we do not have the hope that this text promises... The problem is not with the text. The problem is with us. We overestimate our character because there's not this very plain test that we can take to see do you have character or not. And yet Jesus kind of gives us a mirror. He gives us a test. And that is our communication. Communication in many ways is the great insight into the nature of our character. And I'm not saying that every communication flaw or problem is a revelation of bad character, but what I am saying is that far more often than we realize, our poor character is revealing itself through bad communication. And so you think about the book of Proverbs, where the father now is trying to press on the son this idea of strong character, what it means to be a man. It's no accident that within that he talks a great deal about the dangers of gossip 
of lying, of slander, even of the concept of exaggeration. All those poor forms of communication are overflow of of a poor character. And and so Jesus is going to say that out out of the overflow of the heart, the the mouth speaks. We might put that even into a modern translation, that, that out of the overflow of the heart, the thumbs tweet, or Facebook. If you want to know who you truly are, if you want to understand your, your character, begin to look at not just at the good words, not just at, at the times in which you get something right and you say the right thing or you hold back your tongue in the right way, but literally now every single word is a revelation of our hearts. And that should be a sign to us that our character is not as strong as we want it to be. Our character is not as strong as it should be. And that is, in part, the reason that our hope now is lacking. Because hope now is the overflow, it's the byproduct now of a strong, godly, tested, proven character. Well, what is character? What is it? When this text talks about character, it, the Bible actually doesn't, doesn't use this word a whole lot of times in the Old Testament or the New Testament. It alludes to it in, in many different ways. But whenever we're talking about this concept of character, we, we tend to all have this different idea of, of what it is. And the Bible doesn't explicitly say this is it, apart from maybe for us what we can understand, character in the end is Christ-likeness. That is the ultimate picture of character. So uh, aside from that, what, what are some concepts of, of what character would actually look like? What is the a, a, a kind of person or the kind of man that has strong character and the, the kind of person uh, that doesn't? I, immediately, whenever I think about the word character, two men uh, here locally come, come to my mind. Two funerals uh, that I've done. One, one recently, I, I didn't do the other funeral, but, uh, but I, was, I was present for it. So one, one recently is, is Jerry Stewart. We did his funeral just a few weeks ago. Over and over, all I kept on hearing was he was such a a man of character. Why? It's because he was loving and he was kind. He was reserved with his words. Whenever he spoke, he spoke with with wisdom. He was was humble. I think of Jerry Chastain, a great friend, one one of the fairest men I've ever met in my life. He's a man of character. You just knew that he was going to treat you right. You knew that, generally speaking, he was going to choose the wise way. You knew that he was going to be fair to you in every way possible. We can think about character and the concept of the fruit of the Spirit. Character means to now possess this love and joy and patience and kindness and goodness, and gentleness and, 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 and self-control. Character has this ability to now choose the, the value of a name o- o- over getting anything temporarily that, that might be prudent to us, but instead that I'm going to value my name, so I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to deal with the truth rightly. I'm going to treat you in a fair way. Character, in, in many ways, is this wholeness. I, I love the overlap between the idea of being whole and then the spiritual concept of being holy. Those two words are, are related And whenever you're holy, there is a wholeness about you. You're not one way in front of somebody and and another way in front of somebody else. Uh, From a communication standpoint with character, it means you speak the same way no matter who is around. You don't have this this one language that you speak on Sunday, but this other language that you speak back in the back. There's this wholeness, there's this completeness uh, that whether you're in the presence of a king or or in the presence of a a Hollywood star or a great actor or somebody that you would want to get their autograph or whether you're in the presence of somebody who can do nothing for you, you are the same person. Character carries with it this weight, this substance about it. To lack character means to be flighty. To lack character means I don't don't know how you're going to respond. And, And not only do individuals have character, but but families have character. Marriages have character. Organizations have character. Now, I, I think as one of the leaders of this, of this community of people, there is one thing that I absolutely cannot delegate, and that is the character of who we're going to be. Who are we as a people going to be? We can delegate a lot of things, and there's a lot of people who are far more gifted at other things, and that's going to be their primary responsibility. Uh, but ultimately, as one of the leaders here, I cannot delegate the character of who we are. Are we going to live up to our word? Are we going to treat people fairly and kindly? Nations have character. Those are the kind of debates that that we need to have. How are we going to treat other people? Who is it that we are going to be? That is the responsibility of leadership to instill character within the lives of the people and the organization that they're running. 
Character carries with it this weight and this substance. And it's something that we should all desire, ultimately because we want to be like Jesus. We desire to have that. And this text begins to go in to to show some of the way that character is built. Now, this won't be the only way by any means, but, but I think it is the primary tool that God uses now to, to transform us. And character from the salvation point, from the salvation process, is, is a key element of that. So the text says here we're justified by faith, which means not because of anything that we have done, but because of what God has done for us. We are now recipients of his grace. That grace now opens our eyes in faith, and we now understand the gospel story, that we are now children of God because of what Jesus has done for us. He paid a price that we could not pay. And so my salvation begins as my eyes are opened by his grace, and in faith I respond. I confess my sin, I admit my need, I accept him now into my life, I proclaim that I'm going to now live a life in response to him as a recipient of his grace. From that very point, from that moment that my eyes are opened by his grace, I now have all the promises of heaven, the Holy Spirit is at place now within me, my life is dramatically changed. And yet salvation doesn't end there. That's the point of salvation. But then there's a process. There's a process that from the moment my eyes are open to who Jesus is until the day that I see him face to face, that God is going to work together under his sovereign plan uh, on the foundation of his providential rule. He is going to use situations and circumstances within my life, a community of people, situations that happen to me, his word now to transform my heart, to sanctify me. As I work out my salvation with fear and trembling, he is going to change who I am. So hopefully every single day, even though it won't be evident to everybody, and there's slip-ups, and there's two steps forward and one step back. Hopefully, generally speaking, there is a pattern now of transformation that is taking place in my life that apart from the Holy Spirit, I would be becoming more and more like me. Apart from the Holy Spirit, I would be becoming more and more like this world, but because of God's work and activity within my life, I am hopefully becoming more and more like Jesus. And so he uses my home group, he uses my co-workers, he uses this church, he uses his word, he uses the circumstances in my life to reveal to me ways that I don't trust him, ways that I don't believe him, ways that I'm not like him, to confirm to me whenever I obey him and go his way that that's the right way to go, to convict me and to discipline me that whenever I disobey from him that that's not the life that I want to live, the consequences that are there, then there. He is at work within my life to sanctify me. Character is, in part, part of that sanctifying process that hopefully the longer I live, the more I become like Jesus. Do I think like him? I see like him. I begin to talk like him. I have a compassion. I have a mercy. I have an ability to stand up for injustices, against injustices, to stand up for people who have no voice, a willingness now to stand against religion as those who are, who are trying to take the gospel out of context, to stand against the secularist who might say that Jesus has no role in anything. Character is part of the sanctifying process. And as I said two weeks ago here, and I, as I very clearly communicated last week in Van Buren, it, it, if your character has not changed... If you've been a believer in Jesus and a Christian now for a couple of months, for a couple of years, for a couple of decades, and there is no transformation taking place in your life, and there's no change that is going on, If you don't now love some things that you used to not love, if you don't now stand against some things that you used to be for, if there's not a change in your heart and and who you are and how you treat people and how you perceive yourself, if there is no tangible difference in your life from the time that you met Jesus until now, you don't know him. You don't know him. And I don't say that coldly, I don't say that meanly, I don't say that in a way of ha, 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 I do, you don't. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying very compassionately, and yet I think truthfully, that transformation, sanctification, is a part of the salvation process. And if all you think salvation is, is I walk the aisle, I said a prayer, and now my destiny in eternity is secure, you don't know the gospel. Jesus is now rescuing us from ourselves. He desires to transform our hearts, to change who we are. 
And character is part of that transforming process. And it is a natural byproduct of coming to Jesus. And we be, as we begin to walk with him, he begins to transform us. Now, there might be multiple ways that that character is formed, and I'm sure it is. But I think this text gives us the primary concept. So we can now rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. And I think within that, we can reword it just a little bit to get in this idea of, of how God transforms us. Character is built, in, in our opinion, as trust over time through trials. The primary way that character is built in our lives is as we trust Him over time through trials. Gives us a great deal of faith, a great deal of understanding of who He is. Trust over time through trials. Let, let's begin at the end. Trials. <clears throat> that, that could mean a, a lot of different things. In, in part, it could mean any, in, in any way that we suffer because we are a follower of Jesus. In, in any way that somebody mocks us or makes fun of us or distance themselves from us as we're standing up for the gospel, as we're persecuted in any way whatsoever, any form whatsoever, that could be considered a trial. But I think beyond that, just living as fallen people in the midst of this fallen world, that, that earth is not like heaven is. Earth is not like is, even it should be. That now that we live in a fallen world, we suffer in many ways. And God can now use those sufferings for the well-being of who we are. Those could be trials. Medical issues could be trials. Emotional difficulties could be trials. A, a, a divorce, a struggle in a relationship, a, a, a child that is rebellious in some way. That could be a, a trial of, of, of any type. And, and the amazing thing is is for us is that trial, if you're apart from Jesus, that trial is proof that Jesus doesn't exist or proof that he doesn't love you or, or proof that, that the Christian story isn't right. But to the Christian, the trial now actually becomes the proving ground in which God himself is going to prove himself true, which allows us now not to seek out trials, not to search them out, not to try to suffer unnecessarily, but it allows us now to lean in to trials, to actually rejoice in the midst of the suffering because we know that God is at work. We know that he is at play in what's going on. We know that these are not just random acts. We know that even these actions fall under the sovereignty of who God is. We know behind the scenes God is providentially at work knitting things together for our good. We know that in his compassion and in his love, he will allow us to suffer in the moment for the well-being of who we are going to be in the end. In much the same way that a parent is more than willing to hold their child down as they get a shot, knowing that the temporary pain is going to be far worth the, the long-term health, so God is willing to give his divine permission for trials to come into our lives in part, not the only reason, but in part to prove himself so that our character begins to be proven and tested and changed into Christ-likeness. So we trust him over time through trials. Time. Time. I, I, can, I can accept this idea that trials are going to come. Now, I, I can accept that. I can get to a cognitive understanding that trials are going to come. Uh, the problem that I actually have is the time element. You see, if I'm going to walk through something difficult, I don't want to walk through it. I want to sprint through it. If I'm going to deal with something different, okay, if, if it has to come that way, just, just rip it right off. Just make it happen in the moment. But so often God chooses to use time. It, it goes much slower than we want it to go because he knows that it takes that time in order for us to fully process the trial that is happening. And I would say, I would say that we have far more difficulty with the slowness of God working in our lives than we do with the idea that he allows and uses bad things to transform us. It's not that the bad things happen, it's that the pain continues. It's that the grief lingers long after the death. It's that the struggle continues. It's that the heartache continues. It's that the, the uncertainty continues to be present. The, the lack of feeling of a value continues to be present long after the divorce. It's not just the trial that happens. So often it's the, 
time that takes place. And yet I think God is a wise God, and He knows. He knows that it takes time. When the guy I work out with, I'll give you some time to process that. The, uh, the guy I work out with, there, I, just, I go to his garage and I, I do what he says as far as that goes. And yes, this is what happens. Um, but there are days in which I'll walk into his garage and he'll have the weights set up and they're, they're very small weights. And he'll say, we're just going to lift this today. Okay, I can lift that. I get on the bench and pop it out and not a big deal, right? And he goes, no, 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 no. I want you to take 15 seconds with each rep. So I want you to slowly push it up. Slowly bring it down. A, a weight that is so easy to deal with when you're doing it quickly. It, it's fascinating to me how halfway through that I'm begging for more weight and less time because my muscles are shaking. They're, they're breaking down. Now, what he knows in that moment is that that's the moment I'm actually building strength, but it doesn't feel like that to me. It feels like in the moment that I'm coming to the very end of who I am, and this bar is about to slam down upon me, and he's going to mock me. That's what it feels like in the moment. But he knows that, that far more important than the weight of the trial is the time can be just as useful. So often that we understand that God wants us to go through the valley of the shadow of death. We know that's a part of our lives. What we don't like about it is that he calls us to walk, to endure it, to feel it day after day after day. Now, as a Christian, there's tremendously good news that I can give you. If you are in the midst of a trial and your sorrow is ripe and your grief is real and the pain is deep, there is good news that there is a sunset to that pain. It will just be for a season. It will not last forever. Eternity will have no sorrow. But the bad news as a pastor is generally speaking, the trials that we go through last far longer than we ever realize are going to last. And so that pain and that sorrow and that heartache that we think, all right, I've had to endure it. Why am I past, why am I not past it yet? In reality, it could be an ever-changing grief that we're going to have to walk with for the rest of our earthly lives. And yet God is going to use that for the transformation of our own character. But notice, notice it's not just that crisis builds character. It's not just that difficult times build character. It doesn't. If that were the case, then the greatest people we would have on this earth, the, the men and women of true character would be whoever suffered the most. But that's not the case. Because suffering can actually lead to bitterness. Suffering can actually lead to people giving up. Suffering can actually end lives. And, and, and so why is it that for some, time and trials leads to Christ-likeness, and for others, time and trials leads to rebellion? It has to do with trust. Character is built as we trust over time through trials. As we believe in Jesus, as we go his direction, as we live his life, even when we might fail him in the moment, to trust him, to recognize that, to understand and receive his discipline, and to turn back into a different way, to repent now is an evidence, it's a sign now of, of our trust. And it's as we trust him in the midst of the trial over time, it's as we obey him, as we follow him, as we keep on believing him, that then he can use that trial and transform it now for the change of our heart, for the goodness of who we are. It's only as we trust him over time through trials that our character actually begins to, to be built. Now notice how important this is. I, I was in a great conversation this week over the nature of, of who is a Christian and who's not. What does it mean to be a Christian? That's a, that's a very important conversation for a pastor to have in the, the day in which we live, in which for many the idea of a Christian is just a, a something you were born into, a church you were born into, or a family you were born into, or a political kind of philosophy that you have, or, or just what it means to be a Westerner, or what it means to be an American. Of course I'm a Christian. I, I live in Fort Smith, Arkansas. But that's not what Christianity is all about. 
And in the midst of this conversation, it was a great, it was a brilliant conversation. And one person said, well, well, my God is this. And another person said, well, well, I believe this. And another person said, well, I believe that. And I kindly, hopefully, I tried to kindly said, well, that's all great, but that's not Christianity. And they begin to refute back with, well, you're so judgmental. You're so arrogant. What gives you the right to say that? Well, I'm not saying that. Jesus is. I, I know we live in a world in which you emotionally get to be whatever you want to be. But just because you say you're a Christian doesn't mean you are. Just because you self-identify as a Christian. But then if you self-identify as a Christian, but then make God into your own image, you're not a believer. You're not a Christian. You're not a follower of Jesus. And one of the great things about Community Bible Church and about who we are is that we understand that left to our own devices, we will create a religion, we will create a God that in no way resembles or reflects Jesus. One of the reasons that we love Jesus is because he surprises us, because we know that his ways are not our ways, that he shocks us in every way. And hopefully every single Sunday we come to this place and we take God's text and we go, oh my goodness, I can't believe this is what Jesus looks like. We now have to change our conception of what God looks like. We now have to change who we are because we understand God is not like us, but we live in a world in which people just assume whatever their religion is, and and in this society, it's Christianity, they just assume whatever they believe God should be, that's what Jesus is. He's not. And so you should pay me, seriously. You should pay me. You you should prod me. You should poke me. You should demand from me that every single Sunday I step into this place and I convict you, I condemn you, I correct the lies that you have about God and now point you into the truth. Every single Sunday, if I'm not doing that, if I'm just telling you what you want to hear, if I'm just making you feel good, that might feel good in the moment, but it's going to send you to hell in eternity and that's not what God has called a pastor to do. A pastor's job is to stand up and to tell the truth. Hello? That's my job. And here's what we don't like. It is my job to irritate you. Now, I got to be careful with it. I got to be really careful with it. I can't just irritate you to irritate you. And what I better do first is irritate myself. I better allow the gospel to confront me first and to convict me first, and to condemn me first, and to correct me first. But then I got to bring that truth to you. And every single Sunday, Community Bible Church gathers in this place not to hear what we want to hear, but to be confronted with the truth of the lies that we have believed in our lives that are damaging to us. And then, once we feel that conviction, to rejoice as we understand God's great love for us and where we are going. You cannot trust him if you do not know him. You'll just trust yourself. You'll just be trusting yourself. And to trust yourself over time through trials will make you more and more a version of the bad you. To trust yourself over time through the difficulties of life will make you more and more a version of the bad you. But to trust Jesus. This Jesus that we don't fully understand, this Jesus that we can't fully comprehend, which means I'm going to have to continually be studying him, which means if I'm not in the midst of a trial, I have an opportunity to build my character, to learn and to grow, but I know a day is going to come that the only way it's going to be proven, the only way it's going to be tested is that this God I proclaim is the God that is real here in the difficult times. And so I build my faith, I surround myself with other people, I try to grow in my knowledge of who Jesus is, and then when the trial comes, over time I have to have other people supporting me, loving me, pointing out the lies in my life, the things that I'm not believing, leading me in the right direction. I can't do it on my own. I know the Spirit is with me, but I need other people as well. And in the midst of the trial, as I trust Him, my character changes. And as I trust Him, it begins to be proven. And and think about the tremendous gift of that. For us individually, what that gives to us is hope. We have hope, having trusted him, having believed him, having 
walked over t- through time, uh, through trials uh, over our lifespans. We understand that today will not define forever. We understand how God can use bad times, not only for his glory, but also for our good. He has proven himself. And so even in the midst of our darkest days, when we don't feel it, when we don't believe it, when we don't see it, because we trust him, we have hope. And then notice what this does to other people. It then gives them hope. As they look toward us, as they look to what God is doing with us, as our proven character is shown to them, the great conspiracy of hope that is taking place is that God is conspiring with bad things, with bad times, with bad people to instill within us hope. But then the second realm of the conspiracy is that God is actually then working with us to give other people hope. You know, I'm I'm just absolutely uh, amazed at the compassion and the grace of God, his continual forgiveness and love for us, his patience with us in the midst of all the failures, and yet he continues to love us. And it's that love now that makes me want to be like him. It is that love now that drives us to say we want to be like Jesus. We want to be able to have compassion to the woman at the well when nobody else does. We want to have the vision to see the lame beggar when everybody else is walking by. We want to have the patience to welcome the little children to us, even while everybody else is so pressed with all their great responsibilities. We want to have the ability to stand up against the Pharisee, the Sadducee, the religionist who doesn't have a clue what the gospel is all about but is using it as a sword now to beat against other people. We want to have the ability to stand against them and to speak truth. We want to have the ability to speak with compassion and love to the brokenhearted, to the confused, to point in the right direction. The very base character of what it means to be a Christian and believer in Jesus is that we always know that we don't have character. We always know that you aren't to look to us. Instead, join me as we look to Jesus. For he is the one that we trust. He is the one that we love. And he ultimately is the one that we want to be like. And God is at work conspiring. Using the worst situations in your lives. Using people in situations you can never even fathom. Under the umbrella of his sovereignty and on the foundation of his providence. God is conspiring to make you look like him. So trust him. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me?